In hyperthyroidism, hyper refers to having too much, and thyroid refers to thyroid hormones, so hyperthyroidism refers to a condition where there's excess thyroid hormones. Medications used to treat hyperthyroidism either reduce the level of thyroid hormones or treat the symptoms by targeting the affected tissue. There are two different thyroid hormones, triiodothyronine, or T3, and thyroxine, or T4. Now, if we zoom into the thyroid gland, we'll find thousands of follicles, which are small, hollow spheres whose walls are lined with follicular cells, or thyrocytes. Zooming further into these follicular cells, we'll see their apical side that surrounds a central lumen filled with a viscous fluid called the colloid. The colloid contains the precursor hormone thyroglobulin. The basolateral side of follicular cells is in contact with blood vessels that supply these cells. Synthesis of thyroid hormones begins when follicular cells take in inorganic iodide ions from the blood, along with two sodium ions, via a sodium iodide symporter. This step is known as iodide trap. The iodide ion is pumped via the pendrin protein into the viscous fluid inside the follicle called the colloid, which contains thyroglobulin, the precursor of thyroid hormone. In the colloid, Inorganic iodide undergoes oxidation via the enzyme thyroid peroxidase, or TPO, to become organic iodide, which then binds to the tyrosine in thyroglobulin. This step is known as iodination. Some tyrosine residues bind to only one iodine and form monoiodotyrosine, or MIT, whereas others bind to two iodine atoms to form diiodotyrosine, or DIT. These molecules are then coupled together by the same enzyme thyroid peroxidase. This process is known as coupling. Coupling one MIT with one DIT creates T3, while coupling two DIT molecules creates T4. T4 is generally created in greater amounts than T3, with T3 being the more active form with a half-life of 1 to 2 days, while T4 is less active but has a longer half-life of 6 to 8 days. Once released from the thyroid gland, most of the T3 and T4 travels via the blood by binding with the thyroxine binding globulin, or TBG, to reach the target cell. Alternatively, small amounts of T3 and T4 stay unbound, and therefore they are referred to as free thyroid hormones. Only free thyroid hormones are physiologically active because they are able to enter the cell. Now, once inside the cell, T4 is mostly converted into T3 by the enzyme 5-deiodinase. T3 binds to thyroid hormone receptors which are within the cell's nucleus, and these receptors regulate gene expression, which ultimately lead to various metabolic and physiologic effects in the body. This increase in metabolism uses up sugars and fats for energy and produces more body heat. Thyroid hormones also help activate the sympathetic nervous system, which is responsible for the fight-or-flight response. This increases heart rate and cardiac output, respiratory rate, and mental alertness. Thyroid hormones also increase the gastrointestinal, or GI, motility, and they are necessary for normal neuronal development in growing fetuses and young children. Now, hyperthyroidism can happen in a few different ways. The most common cause is Graves' disease, an autoimmune disorder where B cells produce autoantibodies against thyroid-stimulating hormone receptors on follicular cells. These autoantibodies bind to the receptors and activate them, which causes the thyroid follicles to grow and produce more thyroid hormones. One complication is Graves' ophthalmopathy, which is inflammation and edema in the tissue around the eyes, causing the eyeball to be displaced forwards, eyelids to retract, and giving the eyes a bulging appearance. Other disorders like toxic multinodular goiter and thyroiditis can also cause increased release of thyroid hormones. Now, the symptoms of hyperthyroidism include weight loss despite an increase in appetite because of the higher basal metabolic rate, heat intolerance because the body is producing more heat, and rapid heart rate or tachycardia, sweating, hyperactivity, anxiety, and insomnia because of the effect of thyroid hormones on the sympathetic nervous system. 
Untreated hyperthyroidism combined with a stressor like an infection or illness can trigger a life-threatening complication called thyroid storm. Many of the symptoms of hyperthyroidism then become exaggerated, leading to severe tachyarrhythmia, high fever, delirium, and coma. Now, there are several classes of medications to control hyperthyroidism. First, we can target the thyroid gland itself and either decrease the synthesis of thyroid hormones or prevent them from being released. The other option, at the target tissue peripherally, is to decrease the effectiveness of the thyroid hormones. This only manages the symptoms but doesn't treat the cause. Let's start with the radioactive iodine therapy, also known as radioiodine ablation therapy. The isotope of iodine that is used is I-131. It's taken peroral and eventually gets taken up by the thyroid. Over the course of a few weeks, the radioactive isotope collects in the colloid and emits beta radiation that causes permanent damage to the thyroid. This is the definitive treatment for hyperthyroidism caused by Graves' disease and toxic multinodular goiter, but it could also worsen Graves' ophthalmopathy. Since the thyroid is permanently destroyed, the person will need to take thyroid hormone replacements like levothyroxine to prevent hypothyroidism. Radioactive iodine crosses the placenta and is secreted in breast milk, so it should be avoided in people who are pregnant or breastfeeding. Therefore, administration of radioactive iodine to childbearing individuals requires a negative pregnancy test. Finally, as far as side effects go, radioactive iodide can cause infertility, thyroiditis, and radiation toxicity, such as neoplasia, hematopoietic suppression, and salivary and lacrimal toxicity. Next, we have thioamides, which include propylthiouracil, or PTU, and methimazole. Both of these medications are given perorally and are absorbed by the thyroid, where they inhibit thyroid peroxidase. This stops the oxidation of iodide ions into organic iodine, the iodination of tyrosine residues in thyroglobulin, and the coupling of MIT and DIT to form T3 and T4. It's important to note that these medications do not inhibit the release of thyroid hormones, therefore they require several weeks until the thyroid depletes its storage of hormones to manifest their therapeutic effect. In addition, PTU also works in the peripheral tissue by inhibiting 5-deiodinase to block the conversion of T4 into T3, which makes it the preferred medication during thyroid storms. The main side effects of these medications include skin rash, vasculitis, hypothyroidism, lupus-like syndrome, agranulocytosis, and hypoprothrombinemia. These medications are also associated with hepatotoxicity, and this is more common with propylthiouracil use. Agranulocytosis is the most dangerous side effect since the decrease in neutrophils can make a person more susceptible to infections, while hypoprothrombinemia increases the risk of bleeding. Finally, these side effects are reversible, meaning they resolve once the medications are discontinued. Now, it's important to note that both methimazole and PTU are used in pregnancy, even though they can cross the placenta. Moreover, during the first trimester, during organogenesis, when the fetus is most susceptible to drug-induced damage, the medication of choice is propylthiouracil, since it's less likely to cross the placenta due to its extensive plasma protein binding. On the other hand, methimazole is contraindicated during the first trimester because it is associated with aplasia cutis, a condition characterized by the absence of a portion of skin. During the second and third trimesters, once the organogenesis is completed and after the risk period is over, methimazole is the preferred medication due to propylthiouracil's risk of hepatotoxicity. Moving on to iodide salts and iodine. Here we have a saturated potassium iodide solution and a solution of potassium iodide, 10%, and iodine, 5%, also known as Lugol solution. Although iodine is needed for the synthesis of thyroid hormones, in higher concentrations it actually inhibits the synthesis and release of T3 and T4 into the circulation. So, in contrast to methimazole and propylthiouracil, these medications have a rapid onset of action, therefore they are used to treat thyroid storms. 
In addition, high levels of iodine decrease vascularity and the size of the thyroid, so it's commonly used a few days before thyroid surgery to reduce the risk of severe bleeding and improve visualization of important structures during the operation. These medications are not commonly used to treat hyperthyroidism since the thyroid gland can adapt and resume hormone synthesis after the initial few weeks of treatment. As far as side effects go, these medications are associated with skin rash, drug fever, metallic taste, irritation of gastric mucosa, and bleeding disorders, but on rare occasions they can also cause anaphylactic reactions. To avoid mucosal irritation, individuals should take iodides with food or diluted with fluids. Also, it's important to note that these medications should be avoided during pregnancy and breastfeeding because they can cause fetal goiter, which is an abnormal enlargement of the thyroid gland, and hypothyroidism. Moreover, hypothyroidism occurs because the immature thyroid gland is unable to adapt to high levels of iodine and resume the synthesis of thyroid hormones. Therefore, this type of hypothyroidism is also known as iodine-induced hypothyroidism. Finally, we have medications that are used to treat symptoms of hyperthyroidism, and they include beta blockers and glucocorticoids. Beta blockers, like propranolol, are used to block beta receptors in tissue innervated by the sympathetic nervous system. This could reduce sympathetic symptoms of hyperthyroidism like rapid heart rate, sweating, hyperactivity, anxiety, and tremors. In addition, propranolol decreases the conversion of T4 into T3, just like PTU, and could be used during thyroid storms. Next, glucocorticoids like prednisone can decrease the inflammation around the eyes and are used to reduce Graves' ophthalmopathy before radioactive iodine could be given. We want to make a simple and fun mnemonic that'll help you efficiently memorize and retain all these crazy pharmacology facts. So let's put all the medications that act on the thyroid inside a room and all the medications that act peripherally outside in the yard. First, in the room, there's a giant bottle of iodine with a radiation hazard sign on it for radioactive iodine. The radiation is setting the nearby wall on fire to help you remember it destroys the thyroid. In the middle of the room is a pair of oxygen tanks to represent thyroid peroxidase, and we can put the thioamides here. The oxygen is for a nasty old farmer who's spitting out the window going ptooey for PTU. He's spitting on the five-year-old kid outside who's smashing iodine bottles, since PTU also inhibits 5-deiodinase. The farmer grows giant maize, or corn, with numbers on the kernels for methimazole. For the side effects of these two medications, let's put a pile of grains on the floor to represent agranulocytosis, and also a wolf for lupus-like syndrome. The farmer is also carrying a plate of liver to represent PTU's hepatotoxicity. PTU is a jerk, so he's not the preferred medication. On the other hand, he's a surprisingly good dad, so he's carrying a fetus because PTU is used during the first trimester. Two more older babies are climbing on the giant corn because it can be used during the second and third trimesters. For Lugol's iodine, let's have a large stack of iodine bottles blocking the door to the outside since high concentrations of iodine blocks thyroid hormone release. The stack is also crushing a red hose to help you remember it causes decreased blood supply to the thyroid. Moving outside, we can see the medications that act peripherally. Let's put a propane grill with a laughing face on it for propranolol, next to the kid with the hammer since it also inhibits 5-deiodinase. There's a bee cooking on the grill to help you remember it's a beta blocker that treats sympathetic symptoms. Finally, there's also a buff courtroom judge to represent corticosteroids. He's banging his gavel on a gravestone with googly eyes attached to it to help you remember it's used to treat Graves' ophthalmopathy. Alright, as a quick recap, treatment for hyperthyroidism include medications that target the thyroid and those that target peripheral tissues. Radioactive iodine offers a permanent solution for hyperthyroidism since it destroys the thyroid gland. PTU and methimazole prevent thyroid hormone synthesis, and PTU also prevents conversion of T4 into T3 peripherally. Lugol's iodine prevents the release of thyroid hormones and can decrease the blood flow to the thyroid. In the peripheral tissue, propranolol reduces the sympathetic symptoms of hyperthyroidism and decreases the conversion of T4 into T3. 
And lastly, corticosteroids are used to treat Graves' ophthalmopathy. But wait, there's more! Here's a mind map with all of the mnemonics from the video. Go ahead and pause the video so you can test yourself to see what you remember. Stay tuned for the answers at the end. Helping current and future clinicians focus, learn, retain, and thrive. Learn more.